Pascal. Um, everybody knows who they are, so I'm not going to dive into the most obvious points. Um, but I will say this about Alfred. Um, we don't usually invite VCs to come give us talks. Um, otherwise, Alfred, I would have invited you maybe five years ago. Um, we only invite VCs who uh, have been operationally excellent. And there is, um, I mean, Alfred is bar none. If you look into his background, you know that he's pretty much done it all. Um, and then if you spend like 20 minutes with him, he instantaneously picks up on what you're talking about and will know more about it than you will. Um, so his learning curve that is, is not is true. Easy. Thank you for those kind <laughs> words, but that um, is too much. Yeah. Anyone who talks one-on-one um, -on -one with Alfred, you should be ready and prepared um, before you go into a meeting with him. Um, so that's Alfred for you, super sharp, um, really amazing. Please ask him really difficult questions. Um, don't be shy because he's from Sequoia. He's done a lot more before then and it's gonna be very relevant to you. Um, and then Avichal also have a really fascinating history with him in that we've never really worked together but always wanted to work together and I've been trying to recruit him for the last 12 years no matter where I was, um, whether it was at Facebook or whether it was at Dropbox. And I finally convinced him to join SEC as a member and I'm still on this recruiting phase with him. Um, so he's also really amazing and would encourage everyone to reach out to him. So with that, I'm going to let them kick it off. Cool, thanks Ruch. Thanks for the generous intro. Um, Alfred, I know everybody already kind of knows you and has, has some background, but um, maybe just like 10, 15 seconds kind of um, touching on your on your operator history, I think might be useful for people. I think, um, you know, I thought given the audience, there might be kind of two categories of things we could dig into. One is just the world has changed so much with COVID. And, and I think there are a lot of people thinking about what does this mean for um, technology? What does this mean for innovation? What does this mean for Silicon Valley? And I think both the combination of your operational background plus um, BC would be really, I think, insightful. I'm sure you have lots of good perspective. And then we do have a lot of founders and entrepreneurs. And I think a lot of people are thinking about um, you know, especially given where you are at Sequoia now, how to think about fundraising, and I'm sure you have lots of good advice um, having been on both sides. So, but maybe if you could kick it off for just like 30 seconds on kind of your background so everybody has context. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for joining. I know it's, um, you, you don't need to be doing this. You can learn in better ways, um, but um, I'll try to keep it uh, interesting and entertaining to some degree. Um, just to you know, start off, I was born in Taiwan, grew up mostly in New York City, was uh, primarily good at math. I was the, I was math team captain at Stuyvesant High School, uh, studied math and thought I was going to go into pricing derivatives and uh, options and go work for a hedge fund. The person I worked uh, with at, um, at Harvard, his name was Robert Merton, took a class from him and he told me to go get a PhD. So I came out here to the Bay Area to do a PhD in statistics, found out that I wasn't really that passionate about doing that work. And most, most of the time you're doing very academic work that isn't that applicable. So I dropped out and joined a friend of mine from college uh, to start a banner advertising network called Link Exchange uh, in 1996, 97. Uh, it was sold in 98. Uh, it was funded by Sequoia. Sequoia invested, I think, in $2.75 million for 20% of the company. Uh, that was considered a Series A back then. I mean, given inflation, maybe it, it's, uh, it's fine. But um, it took 20%, there was a 20% pool, and 17 months later, we were sold to Microsoft for $265 million. And um, Tony and I started angel investing. We started a small fund, a uh, $27 million fund, um, to just invest in startups because we loved the first uh, eight to 18 months of a startup because it was just so much fun getting the idea off the ground and, um, and uh, it was fun to work with a small team and iterate and move fast. So that fund uh, unfortunately started in 1999 and even though it was a crazy time, um, to invest and in probably one of the worst times to invest from a valuation standpoint, uh, we, still, we still managed to make some interesting investments like AskG's Open Table. Um, and, um, but by 2000, 2002, there was a dot com bust and we were left with about 20 ish companies out of the 27 that we invested in. We weren't sure what to do with them except for two of them. One was Tell Me Networks and the other was Zappos. Uh, and I joined Tell Me, um, which was in, in one sense, um, 
a voice recognition platform in the cloud, but we had to build our version of the cloud uh, and answering 800 numbers. Uh, that was sold to Microsoft for uh, $800 million. And then I joined Tony uh, at Zappos, where we um, built the company to about $1.2 billion um, in sales, uh, $1.2 to $1.6 billion in sales, and sold it to Microsoft. Sorry, sold, sold it to Amazon. Um, um, and uh, in 2010, and then I joined in 2009, and I joined Sequoia in 2010. Amazing. Uh, so I think um, we, we, we crowdsourced some questions beforehand from the community. And uh, I, I really like this one. And so I put it right at the front. And um, this is, I think, from Derek. And he said, my favorite Don Valentine quote is sold by Doug Leone. It was uh, Doug's first meeting with Don. And, uh, and Don just asked, what matters? And so I'm, I'm kind of curious. Uh, I don't know if you had that conversation with, with Don, but what, what matters to you? Yeah, I think, so Don was always asking these questions to find out who the person was, but he asked that question a lot. So I'll give you some context and then I'll answer the question. He loves answering that, asking that question to just understand the person, um, especially founders. Um, and it was a way to get to understand uh, why they're on this mission. Uh, because you, you have those very almost transactional conversation about the business and the company, et cetera. And Sequoia has always had this point of view that founders at last, founders that will go and fight during like incredibly hard times are those founders that have a personal pain that they suffered and that's why they started the company. And so he was trying to align the mission of the company to what matters to the founder. Um, and that is why, um, why he asked that question. Internally at partner meetings, he would ask that question is, and slightly refine that and to ask, what will this mat will this company matter in 10 years? And think about it from the standpoint of like you're you're investing at the seed or you're starting a company at the seed level. Um, e either way, whether it's for you or for as a founder or as an angel investor or as a seed investor, the company has to matter 10 years from now. And I think one of the things that people forget about pitching since a lot of this was about pitching is tying all that together. So why do you want to start the company? What is your personal sort of reason for starting that company? Why does it matter to you? And why is this going to be important 10 years from now? Um, and so to me, like what matters to me? I, you know, a lot of things matter to me, but like from a business standpoint, I love helping companies scale from beginning from idea uh, and beyond. And so it's a, I joined Sequoia partly because we tell people that we are um, partners. We're not investors. We don't buy low, we don't buy, and then we don't sell high. Our job is to become partners with the founders and the management teams that we back. And uh, we, we partner with them from idea to IPO and beyond. Um, and I think one, one of the things you wanna screen for, for investors is, are they going to be a sparring partner to you during good times and that are they going to be a shock absorber during bad times and that's what matters to me that i want to work with you know if i back you 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 want to be a partner with me i, I want to be uh, i'm not part of the management team but i almost want to be as you know trusted like the management team members and um we have a way of measuring that which is a very easy metric am i the first call that you that um you make if there's something that you're struggling with or you're, you're debating or you're, you're troubled by. And um, so that's what matters to me. How do you get there? Like what, what is the, is there a process or how do you get to that point of being the first call? I'm just kind of curious how you think about that. I think it's a, it, it is a process of like developing trust, right? You need to be vulnerable enough to ask. One of the things that I would just encourage all of you um, to think about is when you find, when you're fundraising, think of it as not just raising money, but as a, uh, as finding a partner. Um, it's an opportunity to find a partner that you trust, that you will, that who you know will go to bat for you and help you during during bad times and, and sharpen your ideas during good times. Um, and that's what I, why I aspire to be. And um, I often see fundraising um, processes look more like an auction. And the auction, 
process is perfectly fine. It achieves certain objectives, which is to move fast. Um, it, it, uh, another objective is to um, potentially get the highest price uh, or a combination thereof. You can run the auction a little longer and get an even higher price. You can run it faster and get a less optimal price, but it's up to you. And I think that what's missing there is forgetting the fact that, you know, an investor is going to be on your cap table for a long time if they're investing at the seed or the series A. The companies these days, even though they grow a lot faster, even the best companies take, you know, 10 years to develop into a company that uh, gets acquired or uh, goes public. Or you can, once they go public, you can, you, you can actually sell your shares because you're locked up. And that's a long time to be with each other. Um, and if you're looking just for money and they're just on your cap table, but they don't really do anything, it's a, it's kind of a, um, a missed opportunity because in some ways they should want to work with you. They should want to help you because you're giving up a piece of the company. Um, and then um, the other thing I would just recommend is thinking about the fundraising process is not pitching. I understand founders find it extremely distracting, don't love um, fundraising. I found one founder who loves, just loves fundraising, loves pitching. Really? Um, and that's a, that's a Porva uh, at Instacart. He just loves telling the story. And I was like, hmm, what is the difference between loving telling the story and pitching? Really nothing. And then so simplify that and tell me why you don't like fundraising. Is it because you don't like telling the story? Well, you need to love to tell the story. You're going to have to tell it to, to employees that you're going to, to recruit. You're going to have to tell it to business partners that you want to sort of do business with. So get good at telling the story, why your company matters. Get good at that. Get good at the elevator pitch and refine it. And it's, it is a game uh, because every chance you get, you, you can A-B test the words that you use and how it resonates and does it resonate better with engineers said this way and does it resonate better with salespeople if you say it this other way. But fundamentally, it's just telling the story of the company and just enjoy doing it. Yeah, this, this point on partnership, I think is a really interesting one. Um, do you have thoughts on how, how can founders actually establish those kinds of relationships or how do you think about that? I mean, I have to imagine you just see so many people that it, you know, you're uh, you know, at the seed stage or the series A stage and, you know, are they coming in and you just see them for the first time and you have to figure out whether the, the marriage is going to work for a decade or often have you established relationships prior, prior? Like, how do you, what advice do you have for founders as they're thinking about actually approaching it as a partnership long term? Well, if you think about it as any partnership or a marriage, you, you want to have more interactions and you want to be able to be vulnerable during those interactions. So I don't think a contest fundraising process makes a ton of sense to develop that day. Right? I do usually think that it's good to develop relationships beforehand. Uh, and it's not that different than you're a small startup. You're again, back to like, don't think of it as fundraising. You're a small startup. You want to get into a company because you want to sell a product into that company. Uh, how do you do it? How do you figure out how to get in? How do you refine your pitch? What do you say? I often find like, you know, we try to look at every single email that comes in and give some thought to whether we want to respond to it. But if you send me an email that's clearly generic and you send it to 15 other people, probably not going to respond. And so thoughtfulness on who the right investor set you want to reach out to, like, because you've looked through their public profiles and understand what's, what they're looking at, what's important to them, why they might be able to help you. Um, and think about like how your company fits into the investments they've already made, which is like a sign of some of their investment theses and craft a thoughtful email. I think you'll, you'll get a response. Um, and then I would encourage people to develop a bit of that relationship. Um, and I always, uh, am surprised that founders don't ask for feedback about their pitch at the end. Like, I can give you pointers on making the pitch better. I can give you pointers on making the business better, what I would worry about, et cetera, et cetera. I think the interaction that you have during a pitch can also be a way for you to learn. Um, and often I find that, you know, these, I fault 
I don't fault anyone for doing this, um, but I fault sort of misunderstanding the process. But if you only show me the good data and never show me the d bad data, it can't really help you. Um, and you know, part of developing trust is to be able to show me the bad data and know that uh, I'm not going to flip out. And, and there are people who will flip out. You don't necessarily want to deal with that. So it's also a way for you to screen people that you want to work with over the long run. Um, certainly, I don't want to be surprised by bad data. I don't think it's a great situation where you only show me good data and then towards the end you show me the bad data when we're about to close. Uh, even worse is all good data up to, you know, up to the first board meeting and then we have a oh shit board meeting. Uh, that's not that's not a great way to start a relationship or a partnership. Yeah, is that different for the seed stage versus Series A? I mean, like at the seed, you, often people just don't, you know you might be just you might even just have an idea. They might not even be data. Like, how does the relationship development work? Kind of when it's literally might be one or two people and, and an idea. Yeah, I think the one or two people and an idea. I think that it is different. It, it's then it's about riffing with each other about why you think the idea is good and. You know, the, the clear salespeople would say how big the market is and uh, there are no co there's no competition. And so the data is not necessarily about your company, but the data might be about why, why this, this market matters and why you're attacking this market, et cetera. Um, and th so it, in every single pitch, I find that there is, there is data um, and data points on how you riff with each other. I think you want the relationship where you build on each other's ideas. Um, and there's this natural rhythm. You can see that they get it. They can see that you get it. And you're improving each other's idea in the seed stage. Um, and that's that's what I would look for. And has that changed at all with COVID? And, I mean, are you guys doing personal meetings still in person? Like, how do you, how do you generate that rapport at the seed stage over, is it primarily still over Zoom that you're doing? Pitches or how does that work for you guys? It's now? primarily over Zoom. We'll take some social distance walks with some founders if they they're okay with it, and um, you know I think it's also dependent on the part, you know sort of people's um, personal sort of situations. Like if you have a young kid, you might not want to do that. If you have if you're living with your older parents, you might not want to do that. So we're very very flexible on that that i think developing rapport is quite important um, and you can develop rapport over email over uh, text over video uh, as well as in person but we you know i i i'm an introvert i don't have a problem sitting at my desk all day long when covid happened i thought this is going to be great and even i'm getting tired of being cooped up <laughs> yeah. um, so i feel bad for the extroverts of the world which is most people um, at least people in technology tend to be introverted and, you know, you're probably okay with some of this. Um, and I, I think the, the process by which um, you develop rapport is, you know, I ask questions like, tell me who your worst reference is and why. Um, you, can have that you can have that rapport with just seeing how vulnerable someone is going to answer that question. Um, and I question. think references matter more uh, in this in this world because I can't meet you in person and judge you in person. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, do you think, I mean, the dynamic just being so different over Zoom, um, do you think it changes the kinds of founders that are likely to get funding or able to get funding? Like, it, you know, you talk about like a founder market fit or product market fit, it feels like the market, the environment just changed so dramatically um, that does it actually bias towards different kinds of founders in a, in a good way? Like, does it allow people to come in and uh, are you seeing a shift in the types of founders that are able to be successful in this environment versus previously, or is there no shift? Um, I think there are subtle shifts. I think if you're dealing with someone who um, is looking out for the shifts, I think it's we we try to adjust for that, and we've talked about this. But I actually think it's great. In some ways, it's great that we do first meetings this way because. Um, you're not wild necessarily by showmanship. I think substance comes through a bit more um, than showmanship when you have to pitch over the phone or over Zoom. And I think that that sort of cuts, it's, it's a bit of an equalizer from some of that stuff. Um, I had a, you know, five, two 
woman tell me that she loves Zoom because she's not always being towered over by all these people who she's pitching to. So it's actually a confidence booster for her. So there are changes. Um, I also think that it's easier to, um, it's easier to back things that are less technical, meaning that technical things where you have to go to the whiteboard makes it a lot harder to, to do a pitch with and things how, show how things might move around and why the product works, et cetera. Um, and so I've seen this more and people start writing more and documenting more and the pitches in a memo rather than, um, than, than an actual pitch. Is it changing the, is it changing like um, the geographic constraints at all? You know, I know, you know the, the history of Silicon Valley has been sort of in this sort of 30 square, square mile radius, but is it changing geography? Is that, have you seen a geographic shift at all? For sure. Um, I don't think so. I don't think Silicon Valley will lose its edge on helping develop lots of great companies. I think there'll just be other places in the world that will pop up too. Um, and then I, I think, you know, you, you have this situation where I think most companies after doing this will question some of the things that they used to do. I was talking to um, a, someone who runs revenue at a fairly large public company and they had, he's like, I don't, I'm not going to tell you exactly how much we spent on T&E, but it's gone to zero and we've not missed a number in, you know, in the last two quarters. And I don't think we're going to fly people around doing sales the same way we used to. Uh, now, are you going to be able to sell your company without having uh, a prior relationship or like meeting the person who's going to pay you a few hundred million to a few billion dollars in person? I don't think that's going to happen either. So there are things that will, will eliminate, but there are things that are going to stay. I, th I think most companies are not going to go to full remote they'll go to hybrid. There'll be some hybrid way of working. Um, but there's some, there's some center of gravity at headquarters. There always has been. So multinational companies have done remote and hybrid for a long period of time. And they've mostly centered around gravitational sort of offices in certain regions and be hub and spoke for a reason. They, you know, the, lots of companies have tried to have um, for example, at home eight, um, call center agents that has worked on the margins, but not completely worked. Um, we've tried remote engineering work and that's worked on very isolated pieces and projects, but not, uh, and maybe you can create them in pods, but it, it's not exactly uh, completely prolific um, and engineering productivity isn't as great in those situations. Um, you know, and, and I think there are going to be more situations where you just cancel a bunch of meetings, like no meeting Wednesdays was being practiced at Airbnb to try to increase engineering productivity. I think that, you know, letting people work from home on a Wednesday in the future may just happen throughout the company, not just in engineering. Could you feel like the, the hybrid comment? I've heard a lot of people say that and I think sometimes people mean different things with that. You know, there's like a, one version of hybrid, which is kind of what you're saying with Airbnb. It might be that you only go into the office two days a week or three days a week, and then you work from home sometimes. But generally, everybody is in roughly one geography. Uh, there's another version of that, which is kind of like, you know, product and design maybe is in San Francisco. And then you have engineering hubs all over the world. Um, like, do you have specific models when you, when you think hybrid in mind? When, uh, I think the things that are likely to work are, grab, are more, more locations around the world with some gravitational pull. Um, I think when people need to collaborate, they need to be in person. And, and do you think you that's can have- a, that's, a, that's a point of view that I have, but it may be wrong. So yeah. we'll see when we open up. Yeah. Um, do you think that with that kind of a model, could you end up with, a, with the center of gravity the headquarters not actually being in the Bay Area? Like, do you think you're gonna get $100 billion companies that are all, in, a, in theory, could be anywhere? Or, or do, you, do you think it's gonna be less drastic? Like it's now the next five markets, like Seattle, New York, Toronto, Beijing. Like, how do you think about where the center of gravity will be? Oh, I think it's gonna be less drastic um, for sure. But I think city centers have quite a 
a lot of pull. I think there was a economist article a few, uh, maybe a month or two ago about New York City and people considering uh, being afraid that New York City was done. That story has happened many, many times, but no longer being the financial sort of capital of the world. It's, it's a financial capital of maybe the US, it's not the world. There are other places that are financial capitals. I think the same will be true for, for tech. And, don't, and keep in mind, people want to live where they want to live. They want to be with their friends. Like when the lockdown you know, is lifted, you want to, you want to live where your friends are. Um, and if your friends happen to still be here, they'll, they'll be here. If they all flock to Colorado because it's a better quality of life, they'll be a, then tech will pop up there, and it has. Um, but I think you know some of the sort of secondary and tertiary cities will become much more interesting places to both live and and to build companies. Gotcha. So maybe uh, we're about halfway through. So maybe one last question, and then we can kind of hand it off to the audience, and people can ask questions. Um, you know, given given all the shifts that have happened in 2020 um, around COVID and and other broader shifts, I mean, I think there's a lot going on in the background in technology right now. Is there a, a wish list of stuff? Are there things top of mind for you that you're like, man, I, I would really love if, if there were founders tackling X, Y, Z or thinking about these kinds of problems? Um, and then maybe that's a good transition to the audience. Um, I, you know, I'll answer it in my own way. I'm sure everybody will answer it in their own different way because they're looking at different things. I sure would love, um, you know, I think there are a few things I would love. I would sure would love better collaboration tools, but that's like everybody's working on that, right? Like. I don't know if everybody has a point of view on what we need to get accomplished together. Like I, I've heard all these pitches like, yeah, we're, we miss each other, we want to sit next to each other uh, as a desk, let's turn on video and let's have a floor plan and you're just sitting. I'm like, does it really help with collaboration? I mean, trying to simulate what we used to have is not going to get us into the future. Like. It, I think you need to sort of, one of the things that I've always loved is like founders who's just like understand that the, you know, the, the making the past a little better in this world doesn't really, isn't the thing that matters in 10 years. Um, and so if you're going to build a productivity tool of the future, you got to think about where we will end up and how we're going to work and why, why that tool will become important. Um, there's a lot of activity in notes and note taking because more documentation is definitely required in either the remote or the, the hybrid world. But again, I mean, that's kind of obvious that we'll do more documentation. That doesn't really help us with more collaboration. Um, that's number one. I think there's going to be a whole slew of things that are going to be built on video as a plat video is the next new platform. There's going to be a whole set of things built on video. Uh, a question is, uh, what are the interesting applications? Do they get verticalized? Um, so that's number two. And then I think that we will continue to see uh, wonderful companies being created in the move to the cloud. Um, but the valuations are such that maybe people are forgetting that consumer still is the majority of our GDP. And I see way less consumer innovation today than ever before. Um, and I don't think, I don't think we're going back to some of the ways that we used to do things as a consumer. I, I just think there's huge tailwinds in e-commerce. Uh, there should be more tools being built in e-commerce. Uh, I see huge tailwinds in Amazon getting a huge amount of benefit, but look at Etsy. Etsy has done extremely well. Why are there not more, uh, interesting marketplaces being built, um, uh, now than ever before? I mean, we have some, we back some in the, sort of previous generation of on-demand, whether it's um, DoorDash or Instacart, and we've had some in ride-sharing. I'm sure there's going to be more uh, ideas that come out of um, what's happening today. Um, and then one more idea for you, I think B2, B2B marketplaces is not a well understood world. Uh, where seed investors and FAIR, which I think is doing extremely well. In the past, B2B marketplaces have been tried uh, with exchanges like chemical exchanges, but the problem with marketplaces, you need many on one side and many on the other, and hopefully they, there's diversity of the many, many 
transactions. If it's five on five, that's not gonna, that marketplace gets disintermediated. Um, and so B2B marketplaces that serve small, medium-sized businesses or small, medium-sized businesses selling to other small, medium-sized businesses might be an interesting place to sort of think about how the world will be different. And in fact, I don't think we're gonna go back to going to trade shows and conventions to show our product like they used to. That's right. Do you have a theory on why you're seeing fewer consumer? Is like entrepreneurial energy just being poured into other markets for some reason right now? I think the, we, we, we have a tendency as human beings to just like to do the, the thing that is hot. And I think the, the problem with that is by the time it's hot, it may be too late for you to start a company or for us to invest. Because back to, again, it has to be important 10 years from now. Uh, kind of have to think about whether something today will be important 10 years from now. Gotcha. All right, we're gonna kick it over to the audience. So first question for you, Alfred. Um, what do you think of the crypto market and how that affects the software world? And you should answer that question. <laughs> I have you're lots of you're the expert. Uh, I have lots of thoughts, but that's uh, I, I'll ramble. I'm, I'm very curious what you think. I, I can give you my high level, which is I think it's gonna eat up a lot of FinTech and finance. And it's, um, it's the first infrastructure that's natively can handle money. And, and, and the idea of like digital scarcity baked into uh, digital systems, I think is a pretty fundamental breakthrough. And we're just starting to scratch the surface of that sort of as an enabling technology. Um, but you know, in, in your businesses and, and the things, you know, Airbnb, I'm sure you're still in touch with the Zappos folks. Like when you look at existing companies that you're involved with, or you know, I know Sequid does do some crypto um, or crypto adjacent FinTech. Um, how are you thinking about it? Do you have a perspective on crypto as infrastructure or crypto as rails? So, I think we're, we've always been very, very interested in, um, in the blockchain and the use of the blockchain. Um, crypto itself seems more speculative as a market. Um, and what separates usefulness and speculation. I think you can make a ton of money being a speculator. Um, my brother uh, works at Citadel he, at a hedge fund. So he, he makes money from taking positions and long-term views. He also makes money from speculation or betting against what other people think uh, is happening. And I, did, I, don't, I don't know if the speculative side, which is holding up what the crypto market is currently doing, is all that interesting to long-term investors like us. Um, now, the things that you're talking about um, were we can disrupt the way the rails are being built. I think that could be interesting. It could also be, it's one of those things that it will take time to develop. I don't know why, um, Governments would love this. It prevents their ability to tax you if this were completely off the books and off the rails. And so to me, I love the decentralized trustless nature of it, but at the same time, I think the anonymity of it causes a lot of problems. Um, and so if crypto, if the crypto uh, industry wants to disrupt finance, um, I think they need to sort of be at some level, understanding that um, being government compliant will be quite uh, necessary for their survival. Yeah, lots of good thoughts. Um, I'm just kind of scrolling through and trying to bucket these by theme. So maybe, maybe um, staying on this theme of uh, forward-looking technology, what, do you have any thoughts on what social networks will look like in 10 years? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I haven't really thought about that, but I, social networks have been very much about um, a few general pillars, which is um, connecting th people through user-generated content. And that's been tried over and over and over again. It's not like it's new. It, like, you know, if you want to think about it, it was originally with text, with ICQ, with, messen with Messenger, with instant messaging, with, um, and then we move from text to um, to photos with with Instagram, and by the way, Instagram was probably one out of um, ten thousand photo sharing apps. They just happened to like land on the filter that made your photos look good and worth sharing. I think people forget that. Um, and then um, I think Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat all sort of fought to win. Um, 
photos and then short term short form video. Um, and I think that the next one will be um, will also need to sort of think about their iteration into video. I think video is not going to well, we're just going to consume more and more video over time. Some of the things that um, have worked uh, here don't necessarily work in Asia and the things that work in Asia don't necessarily work here. But short form video entertainment is a really, really hot space in, um, in, in China, for example. And we have, a, we, we have a fairly large practice in China. The yeah. other thing that's social that I think people are, you know, don't exploit in the US as much is shopping. Um, in Asia, there's Pinduoduo, which is a public company in the US now. And, you know, you have group shopping and group buying behaviors and people wanting to get a deal. I don't, I don't think, you know, to me, fundamentally, you can say that there's all these cultural differences. And to me, I kind of say, I'm not sure it's cultural differences. There might be some other explanation, but I mean, human beings are human beings. I don't think anybody here doesn't want to get a deal. Um, we may be more embarrassed to ask to be part of a deal, et cetera. So there might be different social norms, but generally lower price for the same product is a good thing for consumers. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions in here. I'm going to kind of roll together that I think are directionally similar, which is, um, I think some people are, are wondering how uh, B2C sales strategies might be able to be transferred to B2B sales in a remote world or sort of re relatedly, um, you know, how do high touch B2B or high touch B2C sorts of experiences shift to this, this new world? Um, and, and if you've seen any companies that are doing clever things with kind of their sales teams and their customer support teams as they transition into, into COVID. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the, the sort of idea of transferring from B2C to B2B has been studied by a lot of companies um, that are larger companies and they have a point of view and they're not necessarily willing to share that. I mean, if you think about Adobe, Adobe used to be, you know, Photoshop and then they became, you know, a, they became distributed through uh, designers, you know, it's just telling their companies, I really, really need Photoshop. And, now it's a creative cloud, everybody has uh, PDFs, and uh, they were mostly a, um, an enterprise company. And then over the years, they've gone from mostly an enterprise company to doing, I think, $4 billion to in, in direct sales on their website. And so B2C sales, the tricks of B2C sales are quite transferable to B2B because as the price, as sort of the prices come down for each user and each user is making the transaction, it's becoming quite valuable to be able to just sell directly to the consumer, to the engineer, to whomever, um, get lots of users within a team, uh, bubble up to their manager and the manager says, I want this whole thing used for a team. They talk to, so the, that sort of bottoms up sales has been quite useful. Um, to a number of companies, whether it's Dropbox or uh, Slack or, or Zoom for that matter. And so the, the tricks have always been to try, out, try it out as free slash freemium, um, but be careful of that if there's true costs associated with true caring costs, not just costs um, um, for a period of time, but like Dropbox, once you upload your files and you never churn, why would you? Because it's being stored and you never upgrade. There's true carrying costs um, as, as, um, for, for as long as you're a member of, um, of Dropbox. And so be careful about that, but then free to freemium to lots of users to then upgrading you because you have used up a certain amount of usage or storage, et cetera. And that has worked primarily pretty well. And um, I imagine there are going to be other ways where people use those ideas for and, and iterate them and change them. Uh, Qualtrics have done fairly well with a call center selling to the enterprise, uh, which you would never think would be possible, but that's what they do. Um, and Zoom has basically, you know, Eric has publicly said, why take, a, why take a meeting, why fly out? They basically do all their sales through Zoom um, and uh, Eric Yuan has even sold his own stock by not going on a roadshow and doing his roadshow on Zoom. So 
I do think that many of the B2C strategies are going to change the way that B2B sales work in, in, in not just the remote world, but going forward. Yeah, makes sense. Sorry, do you have more thoughts? Here, keep going. Yeah, and, and I think like, I just don't understand, for example, why people would fly across country for a sales deal or an investment banker trying to pitch a company, take one meeting and fly back. Those days, yeah. those things are going to be over. Yeah, yeah, I tend to agree. Um, maybe switching gears a little bit, I think one of the things you're also um, well known for is this idea of being extremely customer centric, you know, uh, sort of Zap, uh, Zappos was known for the customer happiness and kind of that culture. Um, uh, could you maybe give a few words on, on how you think about that and the importance of that uh, early in a company's history? And then how do, how do you advise companies to maintain that focus on customer happiness as they start to scale um, from being a seed stage to series A? and having potentially millions of customers? Well, I think culture, customer service, customer happiness, they're, they're daily habits. You gotta, you gotta put in the time. It's like fitness, right? Like you don't, you're not going to, to, to go on a crash diet when you know you're unhealthy is not the way to maintain fitness. The maintain fitness is make it a daily habit. Um, and culture, uh, customer service is no different. So you have to practice those things. If you want a great customer centric um, company, you need a customer centric um, culture. And for me, culture comes down to what are the value, what are the values and the beliefs? And so those are the core values. And how do they, what are the actions that you're looking for? And how do you like operationalize those actions? And what are the narratives that come out of that? What are the customers going to say um, that, uh, of your customer-centric culture? And by the way, customer-centric culture also doesn't mean very much. Um, there are many companies that have customer-centric cultures uh, or, and by the way, nobody says they want a non-customer-centric culture. So to say that you're customer-centric without specifically defining what you mean by customer-centric is also a failure. Um, and I realized this when I was talking at Amazon during the Zappos Amazon sort of um, due diligence. Amazon thinks of every single contact uh, to their call center or whether it's a phone call or an email contact center as a bug in their system that, they, that the customer couldn't self-serve. And so they believe in automation. They believe in customer service that way. Zappos believe that um, Yes, we believe that we want the, the website to be self-serving, but if you have a problem, we are more than happy to pick up the phone because it's a it's a chance to give an, uh, a completely unaltered, um, authentic way of a branded experience that is uniquely Zappos. How can those two things those two things couldn't be more opposite. How can both those things be customer centric, if you, you might want to ask? And it just does come down to definition. Uh, we want it to be high touch, um, and that, that means a certain type of culture and a certain type of actions and certain type of behaviors that are different than, um, than Amazon. And then at the same time, the things that you rave about for Zappos, the great customer service because they can, they can call us 24 seven getting their product the next day, et cetera, et cetera, is a different set of things that you rave about for Amazon. And so think about the narrative. It's what does success look like for being customer centric? What are you, what do you want the stories to be about and potentially work backwards? And then, you know, working forward, what are the values and what are the um, sort of actions you want your company to take when you take care of a customer? I have a lot to say about this stuff. So it can go on for a long time. Yeah, you should write a book about it. <laughs> Here's a, Tony already wrote a book about yeah. it. I can one. update the book at some point. You should write the, the forward for the updated edition. Um, the, um, this is an interesting question. Sander, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to massage it a little bit, but um, sort of related to this idea of you know, really defining your values is, um, are there certain kinds of psychological profiles that you find um, you know, tre tend to be successful with founders? Are there certain types of character traits or personality traits? And he sort of uh, specifically, Xander specifically mentioned the idea that some investors specifically look for sociopaths, which is news to me. I haven't heard that before, but um, 
it's, it's an interesting observation. Uh, I assume you don't work with sociopaths. Um, but do you have other psychological profiles that you look at when, when you're evaluating founders and say, wow, this really seems to pattern match to success? I don't, I don't think, I don't know of investors that look for, specifically <laughs> look for sociopaths. It's, a, it's an interesting observation. I want to know, Xander, who, who, who you, we'll take that offline, but I want to know who you think uh, is looking for sociopaths. So I, I think that there are a set of qualities that we look, that I look for, that we look for, that many investors look for. I will simplify it into um, a few things, which is, you know, every VC looks for approximately the same things around a great team attacking a large market with a specific idea for a product or service that addresses that large market that then allows you to have a differentiated way of of pricing, of having a business, et cetera. And if you just look at that, you, you end up with either a null set because everybody's looking for it, or you end up with something that is priced to perfection. And as an investor, if you invest in something priced to perfection, you mean, or you overpay, you, you're gonna make less money. Um, I think different investors look for the second layer of things. Some will look for product market fit. That has been over, you know, in some ways talked about a lot. Some talk about like people who are scrappy and being able to, to um, bootstrap. Some talk about, uh, and I like talking about founder market fit. Um, and to me, like being, having founder market fit and being thoughtful about the industry, what exactly are you building here? Why do you think you're gonna win? It's kind of a dream. So there is an element of being somewhat of a sociopath is because you have not built anything at the seed stage. So you're dreaming about the future. Um, but being thoughtful about like, how do you actually win? Like you're, you're a tiny company with two or three people in the company and you're attacking this industry that has a set industry structure. Like you, you got to imagine some of this stuff. I'm like, oh, well, you know, I don't think necessarily, well, cool, we'll just figure it out. We're get, we have this vision of this product. We'll just figure out how to go to market. Yes, I know you're going to, this is not the most important question when you're at the seed level, but just having thought through that uh, shows that you're thoughtful. And I do think thoughtfulness uh, is important because you are always trying to think one to two or three steps ahead of where you are at and where your competition is at. Um, that's one trait. The other trait is I like companies that uh, are consumer centric businesses. All founders that are successful are super competitive. Um, but I like real genuine insights from the customer as opposed to from the competitors. Uh, Bezos, Bezos always talked about, we don't worry about competitors. We don't worry about, he's one of the most competitive people in the world. The story I like to, you know, telling is after the, um, after the uh, merger and we're talking about post merger integration, I just asked for like the briefing docs or some of the, whatever they would be willing to share about why they decided to buy Zappo so we can get a share an understanding of what we should work on together. And uh, at that time Zappos is 10 years old and they had benchmarking data about us for a long period of time. Um, and so I, you know, I had, I asked people internally, like, what is going on? And, um, you know, he says he didn't worry about competition. And the line is, obviously, it's to be, that be is Jeff Bezos has is be customer obsessed and competitor aware. And so that's kind of what we, one of the other things that we look for, be customer obsessed. Tell me why you're gonna win the industry through your, the lens of your customer and be aware of what your, customer, your competitors are doing, how you're gonna be different. Um, we, we do have a line in our company, our Sequoia's company design program, which is don't tell me why you're gonna just be better. Better gets you just so much. You wanna be different and better uh, versus, versus the comp competition. And to do that, you need to reinvent on behalf of the customer. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of times here, um, the, the seed stage. Um, how are you spending your time these days? Are you are you mostly C? Are you mostly A later stage? Like, how do you actually? Where are you focused? Um, I think I think the so at Sequoia we have an early stage team and a growth stage team, and the early stage team does both seed and A. Um, and the the um, notion is that don't come to Sequoia until you're ready for the A. And I think people don't quite understand that we do love meeting companies at the seed. Um, 
and um, we do make seed investments. And people always tell us they're concerned about signaling risk. And I would just tell you the data doesn't suggest that there is signaling risk. So in um, 2017, we, we made six seed investments. We led six seed investments, 100% of them raised an A. 50 of them, 50% 50 of them was led by Sequoia Capital. Um, so, and then we've upped the number of investments that we've made in the last few years. 2018, we did 10 seed investments. 2019, we did 22. Uh, this year so far, we've done over 15. So we're not the most prolific seed investor. We're not spraying prey. Each partner at Sequoia makes one or two investments at the seed level and one or two investments at the Series A a year. We're not high volume, but hopefully we, we are we are just as thoughtful as we ask you to be thoughtful when you come pitch us. That's right. Um, and maybe I think we have we have just a couple minutes left, but this this last one or two questions might be good ones to end on too. Um, Hari noted that a lot of VC firms have come and gone and risen and fallen over the years, and Sequoia has consistently been at the very very top, number one for decades. Um, what's the secret sauce there? Like, is it a succession planning? Is it a worldview? Is it a culture? Like, what what keeps uh, Sequoia on the top? I think it's the culture. I think the the reason I joined Sequoia is because I've known the partnership for a long period of time, and there's no one at Sequoia that just rests on their laurels. And we there's a sense of we have our ten ten tenants or values, and first one is um, first two are performance and teamwork. Um, we also focus. Another one is just to be focused on on enduring. Um, another one's about active ownership. So we, we are active builders of Sequoia. We're actors, we're actively thinking about what is enduring, uh, both for your companies that we invest in and, and partner with, as well as our, ourselves. Um, and we, there's also a sense that each of us came here standing on the shoulder of giants, and we have the obligation to make sure that when we leave, that the place is better off than when we started. Um, and I, I think the, you know, that is a little different. Uh, we have 50, almost 50 years of tribal knowledge now, 48 years, um, and we, we use that. And there's this tension always between tribal knowledge and reinvention. And uh, we apply that to ourselves and we apply that to the founders that we work with. Um, often founders will tell us that they want to reinvent something. And I'm like, that's great. We've seen 10 companies tried this, nine have failed. I'm not saying no, I'm just asking you, why do you think you'd be the one that is different? And sometimes you have good answers and sometimes you don't have good answers. When you don't have good answers, you may want to rethink what before just diving in um, until you have a sharper idea of why you will win in that situation. And we apply that to our own ideas um, at, when we build Sequoia. All right. That's a great, great place. And Alfred, if, if people want to get in touch, what's, what's usually the best way? Email, Twitter, e what do you? Yeah, what do you email. It's lynn at sequoiacap.com, L-I-N. Um, very simple. Um, feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you for having me. This is a, a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully you took away something that is valuable for you to go back and build your company. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for the time, Alfred. The thank yous are streaming in on the chat as well. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the time. All right, everybody. See you next time.